This is America. This is the greatest country on earth. And after all, we've served our country. We've sacrificed. We slept in foxholes. We've been fired at. We've had to run and, and, and hit a bunker because uh, there was incoming rounds, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and so we've got to take care of them. All right, we're on. How you doing, Joyce? I'm fine. Thank you for being here, ma'am. Thank you so very much. Um, let's just start off, uh, introduce yourself, tell us your name, uh, mm -hmm. branch of service you served with, Okay. Uh, the years you served, and the rank you got out as. Okay. My name is Joyce Marie Griggs. I actually entered the military in 1975, and I officially retired um, September, the end of September 2013. I was Army, and I'm a retired Lieutenant Colonel. Wow, thank you for your service, ma'am. Yeah. And I was an intelligence officer. Nice, nice. Um, talk to me a little bit about where you're from, where you grew up, and what your uh, upbringing was like. Okay, I grew up in uh, rural North Carolina, a little place called Bethel. Matter of fact, it's probably only like an hour and a half from Camp Lejeune and about two hours from Fort Bragg. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's predominantly agriculture. So we worked the fields there, mm. okay? And the population, it might be 3,000, but it was very small. <laughs> And uh, our county seat was Greenville, North Carolina. There was a university there with a medical school. And so uh, I grew up there. There were 10 of us. Actually, my mom raised my niece, so it was like 11. There were six girls and four boys. And I was kind of like sandwiched in between. Mm. And all of my brothers went into the military. Wow. And even my sister, my baby sister, married a, a guy from the, that was in the Marines. So I grew up in rural Bethel, North Carolina. I went to college in North Carolina, North Carolina Central University in Durham. And I got my bachelor's degree there and my master's degree. Wow, yeah. wow. Um, so you went to high school there as well? Yes, I went to Bethel Union High School. Actually, it was one of those schools that we started off with grades one through 12. Mm. Oh, really? Like that, yeah. Wow. And ultimately they changed it you know, over the years, mm -hmm. but I went to, it was called Bethel Union. It was grade wow. one through 12. Now, were you involved in, uh, did you have any hobbies or were you involved in any sports? Well, we didn't have very many sports, and especially for the females back then, during that mm -hmm. time. But I was a reader, okay? Mm -hmm. And I always uh, enjoyed, like with my church, uh, you know, we did community activities. So I was very active in community activities and, and more of a servant even then. Nice. Yeah. Um, wow. Uh, so what inspired you to join the military? Well, I was in college in Durham, North Carolina. And my mom had come up to visit me, and we decided to leave Durham and go to Fort Bragg, go to Fayetteville, and visit my brother, who was stationed there. And I was so impressed. He was airborne, how they had the split, uh, spitz shine boots, and they had their uh, uh, pants blouse and the maroon beret. It was just sharp. And I go, wow, I like this. I said, I wouldn't mind being airborne, you know. <laughs> and he, and I, it really inspired me. And so at some point later on, I did join the military. I was a direct appointment, okay, because I didn't go through ROTC. I was a, sh it's called shake and bake lieutenant. Mm. And uh, so I, I joined the military as a second lieutenant. And wow. ultimately, I did go to airborne school. And I was among some of the first women to go to airborne school at Fort Benning, Georgia. Really? So I did get my wings, yes. Wow, wow. Yes. That's amazing. Um, mm -hmm. what, what's the process like to going into the uh, uh, military as a second lieutenant? Well, it was interesting because basically I didn't have the ROTC background. Mm -hmm. So in the military, you know, we had to go through basic, uh, you know, officer orientation. Mm -hmm. So they taught us how to be officers, you know, the basic, the fundamentals. And then eventually you went on to your specialty training. And because I had a master's, a bachelor's in sociology and a master's in counseling, I wanted MSC Medical Service Corps, you know, because they had counselors there, et cetera. But uh, for some reason, the Army chose me to be an intelligence officer, so. Wow. Um, did you get to select what branch or? No, I didn't. Well, I put down uh, what I wanted, a the areas list. Uh -huh, that I was interested in. Mm -hmm. And for whatever reason, you know, I got it. They gave me intelligence. I guess they needed more officers in intelligence. Yeah, yeah. But, um, but as far as the branch of service. Oh, yes. I chose Army. Oh, you did? Yeah, yes. Okay. Uh-huh. Yep, awesome. I went to, uh, I think it was, what did they send me? They, I, it was Raleigh, North Carolina, I think, to the MEP station or whatever, whatever. Yeah. And, I, and I chose Army. Nice. Because, well, my, my brother that inspired me was Army. My oldest brother was Navy, okay? And then my brother that inspired me, who was I, I was next to in age, through the uh, 
age order. Uh, he was uh, Army, and my brother beneath me was Army, and my baby brother was Marine, mm. and his son, Marine. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Um, so, so you got selected as an intellig intelligence officer. Correct. And uh, what, what was that process like after that? Well, it was very interesting. And, and you know what? I really like being an intelligence officer because it is so, there's so many entities to the intelligence field. You know, you got signal intelligence, uh, you got tactical and strategic intelligence. So with that, I gained uh, a wide array of information from the different and how he interacted and how intelligence is so important to the overall operation of the military. Yeah. So it was, it was very interesting. Yeah. Did you uh, did you have to get like a special type of clearance to get that? Specific? Oh, yes. Matter of fact, uh, I had a special at the SCI with alphabets, TS, top secret, plus, plus. As a wow. matter of fact, I got had a clearance that I could see stuff the president could see. Really? Yes. And of course, they dug deep into your background. OK. Wow. <laughs> and so but uh, it wasn't much to dig. I was just a little country girl, you know. Yeah. They wanted to make a difference. Yeah. Um, so what type of training did you have to go through? To Well, for the intelligence training, uh, the home of the intelligence school is Fort Huachuca, Arizona. Mm. OK, so we had the basic intelligence course out there. And of course, back then they were teaching nothing but so Soviet, Soviet doctrine. Mm. So we learned about the enemy, you know, I mean, all kinds of tactical stuff. And there was a lot of other um, specialties crossed with yours, you know, like communications, uh, infantry doctrine, uh, you name it, signal corps, you know, just so many other. Uh, they taught us uh, uh, NBC, chemical warfare, nuclear, biological, chemical warfare. So we had a lot of training. We even had some, we had field training, map reading, you know, things of that nature. Yeah. yeah. Wow. What was your first, uh, where were you stationed first? Well, <laughs> my first assignment believe it or not, was I joined the Army to see the world, and they sent me back to Fort Bragg, North Carolina, because <laughs> I was airborne. Yeah. yeah, I went to an intelligence unit there. Mm. Yeah, actually, I was, they called it Smoke Bomb Hill. Uh, it was special ops. I was a, a member of, I was part of a special ops unit, uh, psychological warfare, and we interacted with special forces. All of us were uh, they call it smoke bomb here. That's where your special ops were. So, of course, with being intelligence, that all of it just, you know, it just came together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so what was your primary job? Like, what was your what was your day to day like? Well, uh, of course, we would have to um, based on where we were uh, at the time, we would uh, look at the intelligence that would come in and disseminate pertinent information to the appropriate people. Those that didn't have a need to know, of course, wouldn't get it, you know? Right. So that's what we would do. And then also I went up to, uh, I spent the majority of my time, 33 years total with my reserve in active time. So the majority of my time was active duty. And so uh, doing some of my reserve times, I had an opportunity to train at the Pentagon, okay, with the special security unit up there. Um, so that and Dover Air Force Base, which DIA, Defense Intelligence Agency. So what was really interesting about being an intelligence officer, I had an opportunity to train with uh, tactical and strategic unit, you know, uh, the grunts, the guys on the ground, you yeah. know, getting them the pertinent information that they needed to do their mission. OK, and then also interacting on a strategic level, like I said, a national intelligence agency. For example, the I took some training at the National Ground Intelligence Center in Charlottesville. OK, mm. and so right before I went to Iraq and that was really interesting. Like I said, I gained so much knowledge and so much experience. Uh, I think I could be the director of, a, of a, uh, national intelligence, you know, yeah. <laughs> because I interacted with all those agencies and you interact with all services. There were several army marines okay navy mm -hmm. and uh it was very interesting yeah okay what was interesting about it oh gosh because we interacted with the various services and with darpa defense advanced research project agency they're on the cutting edge what what darpa does is look for almost like the impossible to make sure that the war fighters um have what they needed. They have the most advanced technology uh, and systems to properly fight those wars. You know, mm. whether it be cyber, uh, you name it. Okay, you know this um, um, driverless vehicles. Yes. Okay. Well, we went out to I think it was Fort Hood, Texas, 
And they actually had uh, tanks, you know, and other large vehicles drive without a driver. And they were testing those out then. So DARPA is on the cutting edge to a lot of things. Like, for example, the Internet. They said the Internet was created at DARPA, Defense Advanced really? Research Project Agency. I mean, some of the stuff I was exposed to, it's like, oh my God. You know, it almost seemed like, some yeah. of it seemed like science fiction because that's how deep we are to make sure we can do any and everything we can, especially to protect the war fighters, but also to make sure they have the advantage and the edge over our enemies or our adversaries. Yeah, so yeah. in order to do that, you, you, I, I imagine you would have to know what the enemy or these other countries or armies and forces are, are building up. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Wow. Yeah. Um, and see, and being an intelligence officer, we, we're exposed to that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I'm curious, um, are you able to talk about that? Like, I know there's probably certain things you can't discuss uh, because being a top secret plus plus, um, but what can you tell me about well, I guess what I could say is just this in general speaking, in general terms. For example, uh, if we saw our adversaries building up along the border in certain countries, we knew something was about to take place. Mm. Okay, if we saw them moving equipment, uh, uh, aircraft or whatever, in certain positions, we knew something. We had certain indicators, let me put it like that. Mm. So it was very interesting and being able to uh, intercept, you know, and gosh, for example, when I went to Iraq in, uh, I think I went there three times, I think it was 08, 09 time frame. We were getting beat up pretty bad by those uh, improvised explosive devices, mm -hmm. okay? And um, the Brits, we worked along very closely with Brits and some of the other allies. And we had teams, I was a deputy director of this program, um, we had teams throughout Iraq. And what was really interesting when we uh, captured the bad guys or whatever, we were able to exploit certain uh, equipment, et cetera, that they had. And it kind of, it painted a picture as to what they were planning or maybe where they were gonna in intend to launch an attack or set off an IED. Uh, so that was really good. What was really exciting about that assignment, we saved lives, okay? We provided what was necessary to our allies and we, and formed our troops on the ground, yeah. you know, what to expect. And that way we, we were able to serve, save lives because those IEDs were really, they were horrible. I mean, bad anyway. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, being able to, to um, intervene yeah. and stop some of that. That's amazing. Yeah. Uh, so were you involved? I imagine you were involved in some type of surveillance systems and stuff. Is that right? Well, you know what? We have national uh, surveillance sy systems. Um, so I can't really talk about any of that, yeah. but yeah, we, we I, I feel that our military is pretty bad. We, yeah. We're good, we're bad, okay? <laughs> All right, I mean, really, and we gather information from various sources, let me mm -hmm. put it that way, mm -hmm. whether they be human, see, even in intelligence, you had human, human intelligence, mm -hmm. human beings, mm -hmm. signal intelligence, okay? Tactical intelligence, I mean, just so many aspects, strategic, you know, because generally there's long range plans on the strategic level where, you know, you're projecting based on what has happened in the past or what we're gathering, what may happen in the future. So it's, it's very interesting. Wow. Yeah. Um, I think earlier you mentioned you're involved in like psychological warfare. Correct. So what does that entail? Okay. Basically what that is, is to uh, influence and change the mind of the people that we're dealing with. For example, I worked on a Africa campaign a couple of times. So what we did was we developed a, a psychological, uh, a PSYOP campaign, short, to target them, to get them to think our way. And that involved at times leaflets, you know, uh, and you've probably heard it, they used to go out with bull horns and different things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we did, uh, you know, our units, our people did stuff like that. And that was really interesting because you want to win them over to your side. You really do. You don't want them because see, uh, you don't want them to hate us. We want them, we want to win them over. That way they will help us in helping us accomplish our mission. Wow. So it's, I've had some interesting experience in the military. And you know what? I am so grateful for that because it makes me more appreciative as an American and as a veteran, always a veteran, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And always serving. 
Yeah, awesome. Yeah. Um, how much time did you spend in North Carolina? Well, I was at Fort Bragg uh, for two tours. It was like, boy, I left Fort Bragg and I went to Korea. I was with the 2nd Infantry Division along the DMZ, Demilitarized Zone, mm -hmm. uh, in an intelligence unit, mm -hmm. okay? And so that was very interesting because things were still a little tense with the North. And it was like we were right, you know, there on the border of it, yeah. you know, separating the North from the South. And I had to go up once to uh, do, um, oh, do some uh, a review of whatever up there along the border. Our troops were there. And it was, it was an eerie feeling because you could look across and there the North Koreans are, you know? Yeah. And they're looking at us and we're looking at them, of course. You wow. know, as long as they don't cross over. So it, it's an eerie feeling. It's kind of like, gosh. Yeah, you know? I bet. So, so that, was, that was one of your tours while you were still in North Carolina? Well, no, I'm sorry. After I left, my, after I left Fort Bragg, the first time I went to Korea, I, okay. was taking it, I was stationed with the 2nd Infantry Division in Tongdishan, Korea. Oh, yeah. Where was your, uh, where was your first tour um, while you were in Fort Bragg? Okay, at Fort Bragg, I was in an intelligence unit. Yeah. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I started off with PSYOP. I mean, boy, it's been so much. I was with a PSYOP unit for a while, but of course we did intelligence there too. Yeah. You know, it all interrelated. Did you go overseas while you were there? I did. I went on a... See, we had um, various exercises, okay? And as I recall, I went to, I think it was Operation Flintlock. We were in conjunction over in England mm. with other countries over there. So we went over there for various exercises. Wow. Mm -hmm. So you did, like, your, your tours were very uh, um, not, not the normal. Like, right. It, they were exciting, really, because... It sounds like it. <laughs> yeah, because there was so much to do, so much to... There was just so much going on, you know? Right. Mm -hmm. So where, where, would, where would they put you up? Like, what type of uh, environment would they put you up at? Well, like when I went to England, of course, um, we stayed in their BOQs. Okay, it was an Air Force base. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think it was RAF West Raynham. It was an Air Force base. And we stayed on that base, and we trained there with them. It wasn't out in the field, per se. It was more on a, I guess, more on a planning level, you know? So we were... Uh, um, we were there in the uh, BOQ, in the barracks, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and at times, like, you know, we stayed in the fields. So we had certain exercises. We, like at Fort Bragg, we went out to the field. There were certain exercises we went on. We went out to the field and stayed in the tent. Wow. Took a bath out there, you know. Wow. Uh, yep. And ate sea rations. You yeah. know, they call, they call it MREs now. Yeah. But we, all of that. Yeah, the MREs now, they got Skittles and MREs. Oh, God, I know. Good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really. Yeah. Really good stuff. Um, um, you know, I'm curious to know, you're, you're, you're really, you know, deeply embedded in intelligence and you're, you're preventing, I'm, I imagine you prevented a lot of bad things from happening. Yes, uh, we protecting did. Protecting the troops. Um, does anything come to mind on, you know, any specific incidents that you, uh, that you were involved in that saved lives? Well, uh, you know, without going into much detail, for example, um, when we captured some bad guys, the guys on the ground captured some bad guys, Marines, mm -hmm. Army, they, whatever. Uh, I, down in Fallujah, it was really bad for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, they might have caught some bad guys, but they were able to exploit some of their equipment. Uh, they found material on them, basically sometimes where they were planning another attack. And because we got that information, and what we, we got actionable intelligence in Iraq. In other words, stuff that you can act on right then and there. Wow. Okay? And so we were able to get it out to the appropriate uh, personnel, the units. Wow. Okay? And while I was there, I think it was 08 or 09, President Biden's son, Bo, was a JAG officer in a unit. I forgot exactly where he was stationed, but I had talked with him a couple of times on the phone. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh-huh. Wow. Yeah, so, so that was interesting. You know, essentially, you you were the heartbeat of why, you know, I was in Iraq and part of the invasion in 2003. You were the heartbeat of why we we're conducting specific missions because you were getting intelligence. Oh, definitely. We've right? got to have, you've got to have that intelligence. Wow. I mean, if you don't have that intelligence, you might as well pack up and go home. I mean, really. Yeah. And those on the grounds like you, okay, the grunts on the ground, so to speak, are, are critical. I mean, and plus, uh, you all were... Everybody will in harm with their space if you're in a combat zone. 
but more so than some of the some of the other ones. But the information, et cetera, that you all provided, you know, back to us to be able to explore it and to determine, you know. And let me tell you what was really interesting. Like a lot of the guys on the ground, sometimes if we cut bad guys um, and there were some of them maybe had a map or whatever. And even cell phones. It's amazing how cell phones were so important. Mm -hmm. But they may have been talking to somebody in their higher echelon. It's so exciting how you're able to track that. Okay, find out who they were talking to and go after that guy. Disrupt wow. their chain of command and save lives. Yeah. It, it was exciting. <laughs> and I'm telling you, and it couldn't happen without those on the ground, the grunts on the ground, those on the ground, all over, our allies that we work with also, um, to be able to prevent some of those attacks and save lives. Mm. And see, what was really interesting, as you know, I know back here at home, it's so easy to pass judgment. Well, we should have done this, should have done that. But you don't know until you, you're in that situation, okay? Mm -hmm. And um, what is interesting is that uh, the bad guys, if they blew up an American or detonated an I, uh, IED, improvised explosive device, they were paid like 100 bucks, but they'd have to have proof of it. Pictures. Yeah. Oh. They would have to take pictures of it. Okay? And so uh, that was really good because it helped us. Yeah. It helped that us. basically documents them. That's right. And what was great is we were able to find out, let's say you and I have been talking on the phone and we got one of those phones and we were able to track it. Well, let's face it, like they track us now, you know? Yeah. Uh, uh, and they track that and they go, oh, John Doe was talking to John Doe number two, John Doe number two, and it eventually will lead you to the big guy. Mm. See what I'm saying? Yeah. And disrupt his chain of command. Uh, and I guess the thing that touches me most is my tour, well, because I've been went there three times, but my tours in Iraq, we were doing something, um, I mean, all of it is worthwhile, right. but we saved a lot of lives. I believe yeah. we saved, and that, that just, that when, was so important. When was your first tour in Iraq? I went there briefly. I did, went over and did a special assessment, I think it was in 2007, uh, and I wasn't there that long, but then in 2008, eight to nine, I was there, and then nine, then I went back in 09 and came back in, was it 10, 2010? You know, sometimes they start running together yeah, on you. Yeah, no, yeah, I get it. Uh -huh. I get it. So, but uh, Iraq was very, uh, and guess what? We In Iraq, we didn't have enough Army personnel to fill the billets. So we used Air Force personnel, Air Force intelligence personnel to fill the slot. Oh, wow. So they were trained and went over, you know, and everything. And it worked out great. And matter of fact, they went on some live missions. And, you know, with technology now, you can sit there and actually see the battlefield from where you are. I was just gonna ask, were, yes. you, were you guys utilizing like the surveillance to watch <laughs> what's going on on the ground? You could, see, you could see what was going on real time. Wow. Right, you could see what was going on real time. And uh, while I was in Iraq, I think it was the last tour, I worked with the embassy some also, because we were at that point where we began to start uh, transition uh, out of Iraq and uh, Operation New Dawn. And I uh, worked with some of the embassy staff and because uh, I was an intelligence officer and I also had a legal background because I, I used to practice law at one point in the civilian world. Mm -hmm. That was another part of my life, right? But uh, we were creating and drafting legally binding agreements between uh, America and Iraq. Mm -hmm. So I helped uh, prepare some legally binding agreements, MOU, Memorandum of Understanding, if you want to call it. Right. Okay, so that was uh, very interesting. And I tell, uh, I used to tell some of the um, lawyers here, I said, you know what, normally you go to courtroom with your brief, briefcase or whatever. I said, but in Iraq, we had on our full gear, had my 45 locked and ready to go because we had to take some troops. I had to uh, prepare some of my soldiers to testify in the Iraqi court against the bad guys. Okay? Wow. And so that was very interesting. Of course, we had an interpreter, you know, because of the, the language, Arabic. Uh, but that was very, very interesting, you know. Um, of course, everything is dangerous, you know, was dangerous, but that was a very um, interesting and exciting experience to be able to actually go to an Iraqi court to see how they operate. Right. 
right. you know, and have our soldiers there to testify against the bad guys. Wow. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I interviewed a buddy of mine. He, he was in a drone unit, you know, the surveillance yes. drones and stuff. Mm -hmm. And one of the things he talked to me about um, that kind of, you know, uh, bothered him a little bit was uh, sometimes they would find intel um, that would help save lives mm -hmm. um, and be able to watch, just like how you described on the ground, you, mm -hmm. you, know, you could see the battlefield. Yes. Um, but the communication lines were uh, not as fast as, the as they should have been, right? Yeah. And mm -hmm. he had to watch some, you know, bad things happen uh, yeah. because the communication didn't get there quick enough. When it should have, right. Did exactly. you ever have to experience anything like that? Well, um, at times, you know, there sometimes there are breakdown in the communications, okay? And it's like, boy, if we had gotten it this time as opposed to that time, or delayed, like you said. Mm -hmm. And let's face it, human beings, you know, and even though we have technology and everything, there are errors that occur sometimes. Mm -hmm. And of course, being in intelligence, being exposed to so much material, and sometimes it, uh, gosh, sometimes like, I don't want, you know, you, something you don't want to see anymore, you know, or you don't want to read anymore because it can be overwhelming if you're not careful, mm. you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, I understand what he's saying for sure. Yeah. How do you deal with stuff like that? Like, you know, eventually, you know, you got, you got to take a break from your job when you're off. You're not working 24-7. Right. You know, how do you uh, detach yourself from that? And Right. Well, when I was in Iraq, uh, what was interesting is that uh, they had a, uh, linguists and they also had um, I think it was KBR one of those big contractors you know they uh, hired people from all over the world to do certain jobs uh, from the May to the linguist pool mm -hmm. and uh, matter of fact there were several linguists from that actually lived in the US up in Detroit area okay and they were they were from Iraq that area spoke Arab, still spoke Arab fluently. So what we would do a lot of times is uh, when we'll get off, sometimes we would go to each other's room. Of course, uh, you're on alert, mm -hmm. okay? Um, and we would have Bible study, mm -hmm. you know? And we would pray together sometimes and sing. And so even now I hear, even now there was a young lady who was uh, one of the maids. She's in uh, the Philippines and she was part of the group. Wow. And believe it or not, this is because I left, uh, I think I left Iraq the last time, 2010 or 2011. And she could, we still communicate. Some of us still communicate with each wow. other. And then also on an individual level, just to get away from it all, uh, what is so great, you know, with the internet, uh, we call them chews. We actually live in uh, container boxes. They turn them into our living quarters. Mm -hmm. And with the internet, uh, I had a device where I could call home sometimes, mm. you know, and then also I, music. That was so relaxing to me that took me out of that element for the moment. And it was kind of interesting. One night I was talking with somebody from home and all of a sudden the siren went off. And I said, oh, I gotta go. And they actually heard the incoming, the incoming rounds. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, so anyway, uh, so we had it immediately, you know, it cut everything. But you gotta, you have to find a way to deal with it. And like, even after I came back home, um, I was hyper you know, hyper yeah. alert. I mean, it's like, you know, because even over there, even in the chow hall, when we ate, um, you, you know, you watched mm -hmm. because unfortunately some of individuals that supposedly were working with us were being paid by the bad guys and, you know, the suicide bombers, you know? Yeah. So there was a lot and a lot of emotional uh, issues that you had to deal with. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes it required counseling. Uh, things of that nature, because some of the individuals, like, for example, the Air Force detachment, a uh, couple of individuals, they had never been deployed, and they were with an Army unit, so to speak. And so we had a couple of them. There were some issues, mm. you know. And I, I will say this. There was an Air Force gentleman. Uh, he was my driver, and we had to go to another base within the green zone. And I was had an appointment or something, and they came to ma'am. Uh, you know, he's looking for you. And so I said, what's going on? And he gave me his weapon. 
and he was gonna said he was gonna do something to him. So I said, "Oh God, I'm so glad," because you know we had a good relationship with the oh. with the troops, and we talked, and um, got him the help that he needed. And the Air Force wanted to put him out. Okay, I said, "But you all sent him over here. You knew there were some psychological issues before you sent him, but you sent him anyway. You're not gonna put him out." Okay, and I fought for that young man because uh, that was wrong. We got to take care of our own. That's right. We uh, got to take care of our own. And, and that's just me, you know? Yeah. I'm going to take care of you. Yeah. I, I know I'm the officer, but if I don't take care of you, you're not going to take care of me. Yeah. You know? I mean, what's going to happen if you send him out on his own and right. deal with it by himself? Exactly. You know? And I said, oh, no, we're going to take care of him. That's mm -hmm. awesome that you did that. Yeah. That's awesome. So, but it's been some interesting experiences. And as a soldier, you know, a veteran, a warrior, and I still have that fight in me uh, to care for people, to continue to serve in whatever capacity that I can. Yeah. When, when, was, the, um, when was your end of active service? Uh, the end of 2013. So I've been out, what, one on, what's this, 2021? About Seven eight. going on eight years. So. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. And then after that, you did reserve? No. Mm -mm. Oh. I retired officially. Oh, you retired officially? Yep, I, I, I retired. Mm -hmm. Wow. And uh, actually, what's kind of interesting, uh, I'm such a servant, I ran for Congress in 2020. Really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. Because I feel that we need someone up there that understand uh, the military personnel, that understand the dynamics of military service, mm -hmm. understand the VA process, okay? And because I've had to deal with the VA process. Yeah. And I know people. You know, and I've helped people uh, deal with the VA process. So uh, that's why I ran, because I want to continue to serve. What kind, of, uh, what kind of changes would you like to see made with the VA process? Well, gosh, it's too bureaucratic. Oh, God, yeah. it's so bureaucratic, it's ridiculous. And sometimes the way to get it, and I'll be honest with you, I told uh, the doctor here, a situation was going on back in July. I said, you know, I could be dead by the time I get an appointment. I mean, realize I'm not going to die. I said, but I can see how, you know, and, and sometimes um, the bureaucratic red tape, uh, and, and, and particularly with the veterans that are seeking disability compensation, they have to jump through so many hoops. Now you're seeing that the burn pits that they had over mm -hmm. there, now all of a sudden, okay, those that suffer certain illnesses from the burn pit, they're recognizing that, mm -hmm. you know, and it shouldn't be that way. Just like if you go back to Vietnam. Agent Orange, a lot of people had various illnesses that they would not recognize. I had a friend uh, that used to live down the street. He was a Vietnam veteran. And actually, a lot of things that happened to him were classic to exposure to Agent Orange. So I said, look, you got to, you're not told me why. I said, please talk with him. We got to get his claim in. And then he had a heart attack. We got his claim in, and the first time around, I got him 70%. Mm -hmm. I said, just follow my lead. Do what I tell you. We got to do A, B, and C. He was a little hard-headed. And believe it or not, within about a year or two, he died. Oh. Yeah, so it was so unfortunate, okay? And that's what I don't want to see. If they're entitled to disability compensation, let's do it. And what I would say is that I feel that our elected officials should have, in my opinion, something like a task force set up that, because of, uh, to help oversee the claim process. If you come to, if I go to my uh, representative, my senator, uh, wherever it may be, Say, listen, I'm having problems and get my claims adjudicated and processed. I think our representatives should have a task force set up within their office or wherever so that they could help uh, monitor those claims and see how expeditiously or how not so expeditiously mm -hmm. they're processing them. And some of these, some of that uh, service members are dying before their claims are adjudicated. And that should not be. And then also, we still have a lot of homeless veterans. Mm -hmm. You have veterans that have suffered trauma. The way I may deal with PTSD may be different than the way you deal with it. And we got to get a handle on that. Veterans are killing themselves. Suicide rate is astronomically high among veterans. Mm -hmm. We've got to take care of our veterans. And the female veterans, for so long, they didn't know how to treat female veterans. You know, they really didn't. They didn't know how to uh, uh, assess us. You know, right. that's better now, but it could be better. And also, for those that are fighting for disability compensation, uh, those that are suffering from PTSD, those that are homeless, we've got to get a handle on it. It should not be. This is America. This is the greatest country on earth. And after all, 
We've served our country. We've sacrificed. We slept in foxholes. We've been fired at. We've had to run and, and, and hit a bunker because uh, there was incoming rounds, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and so we've got to take care of them. And I guess I'm passionate about that because I've been there. I've done that. I've worn combat boots, and I understand it. I understand the situation. And we can do better, and we've got to do better, and we must do better, and we will do better. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, that's amazing because... Uh, I've been there. I've been on the. I've spent a whole day on the phone with the VA at one point, wanting to throw my cell phone through the window because yes. you'll talk to an agent and uh, or a representative. Sure. Um, and they're saying, well, first of all, it takes about forty-five minutes to an hour just to get on on the phone with that uh, representative. Sure. But, but before that, you've been hung up by the automated service for the first thirty minutes of the phone call, and then you know you're on hold for forty-five minutes, and then you finally get on the phone with somebody and they say, oh, you need to be transferred to this other department. We don't take care of that. Then you get transferred, the phone hangs exactly. up. Exactly. back to the pro I promise you I've been on the phone for eight hours. Oh, like I can believe it. Yeah, and you know what? And especially if you have PTSD, that doesn't help at all. Yeah. I mean, really, it just takes your anxiety level up higher. <laughs> I mean, really, it does. It makes you want to do something to somebody. I mean, really, it's just really frustrating. Oh. And, and I want to point out something else, too. And at times, we have not taken care of the family members of the veterans. Mm. For example, let's say the person, uh, their husband or their wife, lost their lives. And I was just reading the other day where a lot of the widows, widowers, had not gotten an increase in their compensation from their husband's death in 10, 20 years. It's like they just capped it and just stopped right there. Mm. But they can't live off of what or help them live off of what they got 10 years ago. Mm -mm. So that's another thing we need to change. Wow. You know, make sure we take care of the family members of the veterans. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Because mm -hmm. um, without them, we wouldn't have been what we were, you know, or right? had the support. They were our backbone. No, they play a, they play a huge, oh, God, huge they role. They do. And, you know, part of what we're doing here at Urban Valor is we want to highlight the spouses as well. Because sure. I know, I know just from personal experience for me, while I was overseas, and, I, you know, not just spouses, though, like, kids you know um yeah. like you know when you're in that type of environment and you receive a drawing you know a drawing from your three four five year old kid exactly or, uh, you know your wife is sending you a letter your husband is sending you that letter like that is what keeps you pushing forward to the next day that's um, right and they played a major major role and you know I, I just don't think they're being highlighted like they should i don't be. That, that's exactly right i mean it's like because when i was in iraq and both when i could get a chance to call home just to hear them uh, my daughter's voice or somebody's voice, a mm -hmm. loved one's voice, or my mom, you know, it just gave me that renewed energy that I need right. to fight a little bit harder, you know? Yeah. You know, you're not going to be here always. You're going to get back home to them. Yeah. And so that gave you the courage, the strength to continue to push forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I remember uh, on ship, you know, there was a line of phones and they hardly ever worked, the pay phones. <laughs> yeah. And yet I had a calling card and um, every now and then you'd see somebody on the phone and that it's working and then everybody would rush to it and you were just praying that your spouse was there to pick up the I phone. I know, right? And the moment you heard, in my case, her voice, it was like all this weight just dropped yes. off my shoulders. Like, oh. Yes, you know, a was, release, right? And you go back to your, you go back to your room, you know, where you're staying with your platoon or whatever, and sure. you're like, you're good for, you know, the next few days or week exactly. or whatever it is, right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. I agree. So important, the family is so important. Mm. Mm-hmm. What was it like for you, Joyce, um, after so many years of service transitioning into the civilian world? Well, you know what? Initially, it was hard, okay? Because in the military, let's face it, dress right dress. We have rules. We have regulations. And, uh, and I had to catch myself because you might have been in the military, but they weren't. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And uh, they don't understand sometimes the dynamics of your military experience. And so it was frustrating because at times I expected A, B, and C, and it didn't happen. <laughs> then I said, okay, Joyce, back up. You're not in the military anymore. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. I know exactly what you're Yeah, saying. so it, it was frustrating and it was a transition, you know? And I'll be honest with you, uh, like I said, for the longest time, I, boy, I used to have some bad panic attacks. Mm. And, uh, it was pretty bad. And I got some counseling for it, Good. you know, and even now when I feel like I need counseling, I go and I tell people, don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed to do that. 
you know? Um, so it was, it was hard, Yeah. you know, well, transitioning. Yeah. I mean, when you're coming, when you're coming from an environment where, you know, communication is life or death, yes. um, um, doing things in a timely matter is life or death, death. And you come out to the civilian world and that communication's not there or that, you know, instant willingness and obedience and, you know, just doing things in a timely manner or doing things when you say you're going to do them. Yes. It drives like you nuts. Nuts. Thank you. It'll right? drive you nuts. Right. <laughs> and then, well, you're just so hyper. This, that, and other. No, it's kind of like, put, put it done. You know, yeah. we're supposed to get it done. Let's do it now. You yeah. know, well, you're not in the military anymore. You know, so I had to, you know, kind of. Take a deep breath and <laughs> reassess some things like, oh, wow. my God, you know? Yeah, I, I was just having a conversation about this with my daughter, I think it was <laughs> yesterday, t trying to talk about, like, you need to think ahead. Like, you know, you know we're, we're, we're doing this, we're doing that. And she's like, you need to relax. Yeah, and, see? And live in the present. And then, and then it's, it's, you're right, we're not in the military anymore, but, like, it's hard to get that out of you. It it's, is. It's like, you know, an example is, you know, um, if you know we're doing this, you need to take these three steps before we get there. I mean, why did you wait? You know, now, you know, right. It's just, oh, I know it, it is very frustrating. It can be very frustrating. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, well, that's awesome. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, is there any, are, are you involved in any type of, uh, organizations right now? Oh, you, I think you mentioned you're part of the VFW. Yeah. VFW. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, American Legion and, and, uh, Yes. Yeah. Uh, are, are, uh, what types of things do you do here? Do you get involved in a volunteer? Right. Well, guess what? Uh, the uh, VFW, well, before the pandemic, and I, I enjoyed it, we would um, go out to the homeless camps mm -hmm. around, and we, were, uh, we had identified some veterans and worked with them on trying to get them in to get medical care or what other, whatever benefit they could get to help them out and to help them get, become, you know, stabilize them and so that was really exciting and then of course sometimes we would like there were a lot of donations we would go with and help um sort out the donations to see what see who we could give them to things mm -hmm. of that nature so that was that was really good mm. you know and especially um gosh like i said there's so many homeless here in this area mm -hmm. and it's still a big population of homeless people here um, Joyce, what, is it do, what does it do for you uh, by getting involved in volunteering and continuing your service even after the military? I know, you know, you said you dealt with panic attacks and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Um, does that help with things like that? You know what? It really does. When I help someone else, it helps me. I, that may sound crazy for some people, but it does. It gives me this renewed uh, strength, renewed uh, sense that you can still serve. You know, mm -hmm. it helps me so much. It does something for me on the inside and makes it motivates me to want to do more. Let me put it like that, mm -hmm. you know, and then uh, sometimes when you just see the smile on the person's face, uh, they don't even have to say thank you. But, you know, you've impacted their life or even a kind word. You know, yeah. uh, I had this guy one day. I mean, he was kind of out of it and he wanted to do something to somebody. And he was just he was just going through a crisis. And I talked with him. And uh, basically kind of encourage them. And he said, you know, you're right. You know, I mean, kind of balance some things, help him balance some things out. Mm -hmm. And that means so much. Yes. Because if you, uh, to me, if I ever stop serving, I might as well die. Right. I mean, really. Yeah. You know, that's just what it means to me. Yeah. I might as well just give it up. If I can't impact your life, if I can't touch somebody's life, you know. And each day I go around looking for somebody's life that I can touch, that I can impact, you know. Yeah. And, uh, and then also I... Uh, had an organization, and basically it's uh, pretty much by word of mouth, called the Military Justice and Information Center, where I help veterans uh, with discharge upgrades. You know, uh, the VA started changing that. At one time, you could even get anything from the VA if you had a certain code on your DD-214. Mm. And so they started changing some of that because uh, some of the guys, some of them, uh, guys and girls, had issues maybe with PTSD, an underlying issue that was not recognized. And as a result, they got chaptered out of the military. So we do stuff like that and, and look at their, you know, DD-214, see if we can help them get it upgraded so they can get some of the benefits that they work for. Oh, that's awesome. You know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's great. Mm -hmm. um, well, 
we're getting ready to wrap it up, but okay. uh, you know, I like to give everybody the opportunity to, to you know, if, if uh, there's something you'd like to say, you know, before we cut the tape, uh, to leave us with. Um, is there anything you'd like to say? Well, what I would just like to say again, um, as veterans, I mean, you're always a veteran, okay? Mm -hmm. And I would say, uh, never stop serving, because as you serve others, it helps you. It helps you work through some issues that you may not realize were deep within, and sometimes they, it causes them to come to the surface and it can help you, and you can become a better person. Mm -hmm. So I say never stop serving. Always a veteran. Give of yourself. Mm -hmm. And when we joined the military, we joined to serve, didn't we? Yes. Okay? To protect and defend the U.S. Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Okay? And unfortunately, we do have some domestic enemies. Okay? Mm -hmm. But this is a great nation. I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. Yes, we may have some issues. We may have some problems. But I always say, let's work together. You know, we can uh, disagree, but let's work together to solve the issues and make this world a better place for not only my children, but for your children, for all of our children. Mm -hmm. Never stop serving. We're always veterans. Exactly. Uh, and this is what we're here for. This is why we're doing what we're doing. Um, in fact, by you contributing your story uh, to our project here at Urban Valor, you know, you're helping me personally on a selfish level because, you know, I deal with all the PTSD and stuff, but yeah. um, you're going to help a multitude of veterans that see your story um, that are feeling the same way. So I um, just wanted to say thank you for being here and telling your story. Uh, yes. And thank and, you for your service. Well, and thank you all. And one thing I think I might have forgot, you see, I, 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 sometimes I forget things. That's okay. I did receive the Bronze Star when I was in Iraq. Did you? For some work there, yes. Let's talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> what did you do to get that? Well, uh, it was at a very critical time when we were, again, gathering information about um, the enemy, and we were able to put together some actionable intelligence, you know, day-to-day -day operations, et cetera, et cetera. And we were able, like I said before, to help save lives based on what we were able to gather, mm -hmm. you know, and... Um, <clears throat> I mean, unselfishly, you know, that's what we were there for, uh, but also to protect and to defend and also to make sure uh, our democracy was not impeded, make sure that we kept the enemy over there and not they didn't come back over here and try to destroy us at home. So those are some things that I did with the, with the unit I was in, the intelligence unit I was with, to help protect not only Americans but our allies. Matter of fact, the, uh, the British, because uh, they thought we were going to pull a team from their location and said, please don't take our team. So no, we're gonna leave them here, you know, because they were getting beat up pretty bad, okay? Mm. And so when we put teams there, it really helped them. So a combination of all those things, and I was awarded the Bronze Star Medal. Wow, congratulations. Thank That's you. That's awesome. And you know what? I give it all to those that made me what I am. Like uh, Colin, General Powell, mm. uh, boy, and so many other generals. But especially with General Powell, uh, Gosh, you know, I uh, I was elevated on his shoulders. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I mean, they paved the way. And for other men and women, they paved the way for me. And that's what I wanted to do, pave the way for others. Make it a little bit easier. Yeah. But never forget that we're servants first. Right. If we could keep that first and foremost, we'll be all right. Yeah. And you have so much to give back. That's right. That's right. Thank you for your service, ma'am. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Push it to the limit, I can't go no more Red light, no way I'm coming back home Long dirt road all on my own I'ma be the greatest, write my name in the stone Write my name in the stone Yeah, I'm coming back home